Hello, and welcome to this Royal Society video podcast. I'm Claire Birch, and I'm at the Space Research Centre at the University of Leicester with Dr Hugo Williams, Dr Richard Ambrosi, and Dr Nigel Bannister. Together, they have written a paper published in Proceedings A entitled A Mars Hopping Vehicle Propelled by a Radioisotope Thermal Rocket, Thermofluid Design and Materials Selection. The paper discusses the engineering principles for a new breed of space vehicle which essentially hops and the research from which may lead to a greater understanding of our celestial neighbour. So Richard, why are you designing Mars vehicles in the first place? Well, um, we want to understand the evolution of Mars, we want to understand um, uh, the, the history of Mars, uh, and understanding how Mars evolved, understanding how it was formed will allow us to understand how the solar system was formed. So sending vehicles to Mars, uh, either orbiting vehicles or landers, will allow us to study the surface and the subsurface of Mars, sample uh, the surface and, and analyze samples to determine how uh, the planet evolved. Um, we could answer some questions related to whether there was uh, life in the past um, and determine, for example, whether um, Mars had a much wetter history and uh, if uh, surface features indicate that it did have a wetter history, then where did this water go? So there are a whole host of science questions we want to answer. So what features exist on Mars that might make navigation difficult? Well, uh, the, the interesting features of Mars, are the smoother uh, plains in the north and the, the, the rockier, uh, more cratered southern hemisphere. So you have uh, differences in altitude in the southern hemisphere. You have craters, you have canyons, uh, rocky outcrops, boulders. All these features mm -hmm. make navigation difficult. And the distance uh, between the Earth and Mars means you can't pilot a vehicle. You have to build in some autonomy so that vehicles can negotiate around some of these obstacles. Uh, and building vehicles that um, can take the obstacles into account, so more innovative vehicle concepts, will allow us to better study uh, the, the, the planet. So there's been various missions to Mars before. How are these traditional vehicles propelled? Well, if we take uh, the uh, very successful Spirit and Opportunity uh, uh, rovers, uh, they've been powered by solar power. Um, and next year, at the end of next year, uh, the, the US will be launching, NASA will be launching uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, and that will be powered by a radioisotope thermal generator. Uh, this would be th the first time that a rover on the surface of a planet is powered by a nuclear power source. Um, so we have to look at the limitations that uh, solar-powered vehicles might have. Solar-powered vehicles don't like uh, dark, cold regions. They're wheeled vehicles, so therefore differences in altitude, steep slopes, rocky outcrops, rocky features are difficult to uh, negotiate. Um, and if you're solar-powered, there are limitations or challenges when operating at night. So having an alternative power source means you you can improve mobility, you can extend the range, and, and you can operate over uh, periods of the day where you don't have uh, solar power uh, available. So how will these new hopping vehicles be different? The hopping vehicle is different because of the power source that it uses. So at the heart of the vehicle is a radioisotope heat source. But it's a heat source which can be used in two ways. So in one mode, the heat source is being used to impart thermal energy into the propellant, which is carbon dioxide, accelerates the propellant out of the vehicle in much the same way that a, a rocket motor works. So you have an action and reaction, and it propels the rocket forward. But the fuel is actually gathered from the Martian atmosphere. So it's a carbon dioxide fuel. And therefore, we have to have the capability to refuel the craft after every hop. So the heat source can be switched into a mode in which it's generating electrical power through, for example, a Stirling cycle generator. And that electrical power can be used to drive a compressor, which then gathers carbon dioxide gas from the Martian atmosphere, compresses it into tanks, and then we're ready to start the cycle again, switch back to heat mode, heat the gas, propel. So what advantages does this vehicle have over the traditional rovers? Well, I think it's important to say that traditional vehicles like the, uh, the, the Martian rovers that we've seen have been fantastically successful in providing an enormous amount of information on the Martian surface. 
um, the hopper answers different requirements. So where you have a, a terrain in which you perhaps wouldn't wish to drive a rover, for example, very rocky terrain or very steep inclines, um, things like craters, for example, a hopper can, can access those regions without any problems. Um, so we could get into areas on Mars that just haven't been accessible to us before. So your study concentrates on the feasibility of such a vehicle. What were the main areas of your research? We focused on the rocket motor itself, so the motor that propels the vehicle during these hops. Uh, principally, how the design features of that motor um, translate into the performance of the vehicle. Uh, the whole study is part of a large collaborative effort with colleagues at uh, Astrium Limited, a spacecraft engineering company, uh, and the Centre for Space Nuclear Research at the Idaho National Labs in the States. So our part of the work, or our main interest, uh, for the purposes of this paper was, was the rocket motor itself. How does the performance of a hopping vehicle like this differ from a conventional rocket? Well, in a conventional rocket, uh, you want to maximise the mass of propellant that you carry and minimise the mass of all the other structure and items to give you the best performance. With a radioisotope fueled stored thermal rocket like this, we have this, this core that we store the thermal energy in. And because that stores energy, it contributes both to the propellant capacity and to the sort of dead weight, if you like. So it's not immediately obvious how we optimise that. And the approach we took was to develop a relatively simple mathematical model initially, uh, and then use a more complex simulation to refine our understanding. So what were the main findings of your research? Uh, so first of all, on, on the hop range, uh, we, uh, along with our modelling and input from our collaborators, feel that uh, a hop range of about a kilometre is feasible, and that's for a vehicle that's, that's relatively large and has uh, quite a comprehensive suite of scientific instrument, instrumentation on board. Um, in terms of the core geometry, uh, we, uh, we compared a core that consisted of uh, basically channels through a solid block of material with a core that consisted of thousands of uh, spherical pebbles and the latter, the, the pebble bed core, gives, uh, gives slightly better performance. Um, finally, what are we going to make this core out of? We uh, evaluated a number of materials, um, and we've identified a group of materials that we, that we think would be, would be optimum, um, principally beryllium, which is a metal alloy, um, and boron carbide, which uh, is an advanced engineering ceramic. Uh, now, there are pros and cons of each of those, and the intention of the work at this stage wasn't to make a formal decision, just to understand the factors that go into the selection and see whether uh, the concept would be feasible. As the vehicle uses a radioisotope for energy, is there any risks involved? Well, radioisotope um, thermal power sources um, have been used in the past, since the Voyager days, for example. Uh, so there's a, there's a long history of... Um, uh, development of radioisotope thermal power sources. Uh, so many of the risks are, are known. There have been, uh, there's been a lot of work done in uh, um, improving the design of these uh, systems. There's been a lot of work done in improving the materials used uh, and also understanding uh, what the risks might be, ensuring that uh, uh, these are reduced uh, as much as possible. So there are technical challenges. We are, look, we are talking about a, an innovative uh, propulsion system. Uh, so we are working with um, uh, partners in the UK, looking at innovative materials that will make the use of radioisotopes in this way safer with a reduced risk um, uh, from a technical perspective, but also from a mission perspective. Are there any limitations in your research? Well, it's a, an early stage concept study. So uh, we've had to make some simplifying assumptions in order to get a, a reasonable answer out. And one area that we've had to make a particular simplification was that we haven't simulated in detail the trajectory of the vehicle. Um, now that's something we're addressing, we're addressing now. So how far exactly are we from seeing these hopping vehicles on Mars? Well, the thing with developing any kind of complex aer aerospace system is that it takes a long time and we're really at that, that first stage. Timescales for the development and realisation of this are not dissimilar to the timescales for any major mission, so perhaps 10, 15 years to, to develop the technology to a point where it could actually be used on the surface.
probably early 2020s to mid 2020s at, at the earliest. But it's part of a much broader range of, of Mars exploration involving several collaborative programs. The long term aim is to uh, send human explorers to Mars. I think this has been something that has um, been around for a long time, this concept that, that people will uh, one day explore Mars. So developing these technologies, developing nuclear power systems and utilizing resources in situ on the planet will, will help pro produce the technologies or develop the technologies that will enable uh, human explorers to uh, exist on Mars, to live on Mars and explore the surface. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. And thank you for watching this Royal Society video podcast.